Okay, great. Thank you for coming. And uh, it's an honor to come here again at the Saba Society talk. And um, I've, over the years, I've been giving talks uh, here at this particular platform on multiple occasions, which I equally enjoyed it. And welcome, Fuza. <laughs> yeah. So, so today, you know, this is going to be a very informal talk. Uh, it's for me, it's kind of a reflex of my past five decades of life. And then, uh, and then finally to what I am today. And if you know, two years ago, I was in ICO for one week. And then that really like, oh, makes me realize that life is really fragile. You know, the patient who was, who was beside me did not make it out uh, alive. She was back out, uh, he was back out. So it was very, very sad. So I hope that Today, I can tell my story, and if you really want to know my story, uh, I got this, uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Pai wrote my biography called Saving Sun Bear, and also a series of wildlife worm with different kind of wildlife for, for, for teenage and, and kids. Yeah, so a little bit of advertisement, so that would be a complete uh, story uh, of my, <laughs> yeah, complete story of my, of my, of my, of my journey, so to speak. Okay, so today's the tale of wildlife Wong, all right, so, and I would like to start with the first picture of me and my mom. Yeah, when I was really young, the, the, the picture is a little bit distorted. I was not that fat, actually. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, you know, mom is always the greatest, okay? There's no question asked about it. And for me, it's the same. Mom is always the greatest because my mom taught me a lot of things. The reason why I become a wildlife biologist, I would say, is because of my mom and my dad. Both of them have taught me, especially my moms, to raise little chicks of sparrow. Little, uh, when I was in childhood, I have a sparrow that was fall from nest. I have mina that fell from nest. I have uh, 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 zebra dove. And uh, mom taught me how to do it, you know. And mom is the one who taught me use uh, rice, grind it, and then put it in a, a sack, cut a little bit of holes, and then poke that little sack with a, with a, with the edge uh, filled with holes, stuck it into the, um, the the little chicks, which is like you know no no feather, yeah and then I'll squeeze it and slowly raise it and then at a certain point we can use a little toothpick to feed the chicks with the uh, rice mixture together with other goodies okay so mom and then uh, because i was uh, um some people thought my face looks like my mom don't you think so <laughs> a little bit well uh, yeah and then uh, so mom is always greatest and because i was the babies of of big family. I have four elder brothers and four elder sisters. Uh, my dad, my mom, my eldest sister, uh, Wong Siu Mei, who is uh, 24 years old, older than me. My third sister, my second sister, and my fourth sisters. And then my fourth brother, third brother, my eldest brother, and my second eldest brothers. Uh, uh, nine sibling. And because of our age stress that long, the very first time that all of us meet together, when I was, all of the siblings all meet together for the very first time when, when I was 12 years old. Because when I was born, my sister already overseas in Taiwan, my brother already overseas in Japan, uh, my third brothers, you know, so on, uh, overseas in, uh, in, in, in US and so on and so forth. So, so with this kind of, um, uh, family, uh, it creates me. And then my dad is a professional uh, tailor, so we are not grow up in a rich family. And then uh, with so many mouths to feed, obviously he has to work really hard in order to upraise the, 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 the big family. Uh, yeah, so and then uh, how we works out is that, you know, we all, most of us have uh, studied overseas. And uh, through this big brothers support the younger brothers or younger sister, that kind of system. And then for me, because I'm the youngest, I don't have any responsibilities to support. 
So literally, I, I can have the freedom of doing what I wanted to do. So thanks to my moms and my dad. So thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. Yeah, and then since childhood, I have raised many, many kind of, uh, of, uh, of pets. And then some of the pictures show here is actually from my real pets. And obviously, when I was a kid, we don't have digital camera. We have the film, negative uh, films, uh, point and shoot cameras. And then uh, these are some of my uh, pet fish, dogs, my oversized Pomeranian called Robin, and my uh, uh, um, English Cocker Spaniel, Jojo. And uh, it was a great time to raise lots of uh, typical pets and then unconventional pets as well. Uh, when I was uh, little, I, I don't have the, the, the picture to show you because obviously at that time I, I don't have a camera. Uh, I have kept um, a, common, a baby common palm civet. I have kept uh, soft shell turtles. Every day I have to go to the local fish market and buy one ringgit of uh, ikan uh, kembung. Half of it I would pan fry, and then half of it I would uh, pan fry and feed it to the cats. Half of it chop into pieces raw, feed it to the uh, soft shell turtles. Uh, and then uh, I have scorpion. Oh my goodness, scorpion is cool. Why? Because the way how they feed, how they capture their prey, my goodness, it's the coolest thing I ever seen in my whole life. You know, the pincers that on his, uh, on the scorpion's mouth, it's really amazing. And obviously at the times, there's no net jewel, there's no animal planet. And then uh, I managed to, to see wildlife or observe wildlife through my real eyes from my own pets. Ah, uh, come, yeah, can come here and uh, sit here. Yeah. And then, uh, and then when I start to read, and I love to have uh, books about animals, raising fish, raising birds. And then when I was in high school, there's another amazing thing that I keep, which is birds. Uh, this is the eggs from my own uh, but, but jerigos, yeah. And then uh, they were hatched like that. It was really amazed me because I managed to witness from my own eye a tiny little white eggs hatch into this tiny little pinky hatchling. And then the little pinky will soon grow into beautiful bajerigos. And I also keep a bunch of Fisher lovebirds as well. And then when I was in high school, I become the breeder that supplies Fisher lovebirds and also uh, bajerigos to the local uh, pet sh shop. So I have my little, huh? How much is it? 30 ringgit. 30 ringgit? Yeah, 30 ringgit. So the 30 ringgit, the pet shop will sell it for 70 ringgit. You know, so 30 ringgit, hey, almost more than 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is, is expensive. Yeah, expensive. You know, so, so, so that was great. So I was a very, and then I, I, no one teach me how to, you know, this aviary, I made it myself with my hands and wire. And then this little coconut shell, I cut it myself, scoop it myself, I sewed it myself. Uh, it was a great uh, pastime, hobby. I'm a big time hobbyist. And then, and then through, through this kind of uh, animal keeping, weakness, the whole process of life. It's really amazing. And then when I breed a uh, uh, rabbit, this is also my pet rabbit. Beautiful, you know, how the male and the female mated, the male, the female, how many of you have had uh, uh, rabbits be before? Yeah, some of you, are, some of you of you, and then the female rabbit will start to pluck her hair and then make it a clump and then give birth. Oh, it was really fun to watch. And of course, the, the, the baby rabbits is like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and then, uh, so, so since standard one, when I was seven years old in primary school, Every year, we have a student record card in that column called Ambitions. I always fill up with two things. One is veterinarian, the other one is animal expert. Every single year is like that. And my teacher laughed at me because the rest of our, my fellow students would write engineer, doctor, lawyer, you know, all this 
uh, very glamorous and important uh, uh, kind of professions. And for me, is what does animal experts do? I don't know, but I just want to work with animals. So, so and then another is, of course, veterinarian. And I've, I'd, at times, I know all oh, veterinarians, animal doctor, is the only professions that work closely with animals. And then, I, and therefore, after my SD, SPM, SDPM, there's only one university where I want to attend, which is UPM Vet Plus. Okay, university, at that time, it's University Pertanian Malaysia, and right now it's University Putra Malaysia. Uh, at that time, Malaysian populations, it was back in 1997, 90, 1999, 1998, 99. Uh, Malaysian population have 16 million uh, people. In theory, 1 million people to one university, Malaysia should have uh, 16 universities. And at the times, uh, Malaysia only have like six uh, uh, government universities. And one of, only one of them offer the VET course. So the competition is really high. And if you still remember, at the times we have a quota system. So it's even more challenging for me to get into the university and study VET. Uh, because I'm, I was not a you know great straight A student in high school, right? Yeah, and then uh, so when two times of uh, of uh, of attending STPM, my results still not ideal to get into the vet school. At one point, I was about to give up. I have another hobby, which is called cooking. And then uh, and then I was you know start to looking at culinary school especially the one in Japan. And then uh, and my third sister uh, told me that, do you want to be the chef or the cook, cook in the kitchen or the person who dined in, in a nice restaurant and enjoy, enjoy my meal? And I choose to be the one who want to dine in and not the one who cook in the kitchen. So I did not choose that culinary career. So I went to Taiwan. And then another sister of me, uh, my fourth sister of me, told me that if plan A doesn't work, there's always plan B. If plan B doesn't work, always plan C. So don't give up my dreams. So I've continued to pursue my dreams and because Malaysia, UPM cannot get in, so I went to Taiwan. And at the times, my, uh, my, uh, my eldest uh, sister studied in Taiwan, my eldest brother studied in Taiwan, my third elder sister studied in Taiwan. My fourth uh, elder brother studied in Taiwan. So we have a, you know, a connection with Taiwan. And at the time, my fourth brothers uh, studied in Taiwan. So that would be the most closest, easiest way to study abroad. And relatively, the tuition fee is relatively cheap compared to US, UK, Australia, and uh, the, the Western university systems. So I went to Taiwan, uh, National Ping Tung University of Science and Technology, to do a diploma on veterinary and animal science. And then uh, at the times it was great. I worked with so many animals, uh, yeah, and uh, worked with animals. But the course is designed to work with livestock. At the times, veterinary is all about livestock. Livestock means cattle, goat, uh, pigs, chicken. Uh, and all of these animals would end up dead, right? In livestock industry, all of them being slaughtered. Just now I had my oxtail, you know, come from animal husbandry, animal size. Yeah, and then all of them are, are, are uh, all of these animals are being produced very inhumanely. In the vet class, we castrated piglet, male piglet, without any anesthetic. That is... Actually, it's a violation of animals' cruelties or animals' rights or animal welfare. But this is what the industry has been doing. I dehorn cattle. Oh, the bull was like jumping up and down. And once I zoop, and then the blood would swell out from the, from the horn. And then another uh, students would be like burning the plate of uh, metals to seal the wound. It was really, really gruesome. You know, I went to uh, Avachua, the slaughterhouse, to see how the pigs being slaughtered and whew, yeah, it was really intense. And then in our vet school, 
uh, I thought veterinary is supposed to help and save life of animals, right? No, it is not. It is not that way. It is all about when animal coming in, we shock them to death. We clip it on the leaves and also the anus, and then click, and then yeah, and then cut it open and to see or do a necropsy and see what is uh, what is wrong with the levers, with the uh, internal organs, and then manage to come up with or uh, isolate the bacteria or virus or whatever that caused the, 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 the animals to uh, become sick, and then apply medicine to the rest of the herds. The whole industry of animal production is all about money. It's not about welfare, it's not about animal rights, no, it's all about how to produce such and such of livestock or meat product with the minimum cost so that you can gain the maximum profit. It's all about profit. Yeah, so, and then I realized that, hey, I, I'm not, I did not sign up for this, but I equally enjoy, enjoy working with all these kind of farm animals, uh, including pigs, you know, and this is little piggy, uh, the piglet that we did an operations on her, and then I, later on, I raised her up. Yeah, in our pig farm. And then uh, that little pig is also my Hong Niang. Hong Niang is the Mei Ren. Uh. How do you say Mei Ren in English? Huh? Biu? Mei Ren. No. no, Hong Niang. So it means, it means that this little pig, because of this picture, I s start to pay attention on this beautiful girl who become my wife later on. <laughs> yeah, so, so one day, so this little pig, I, every day I walk her in our farm, in our field. It's really cool. And pigs are so intelligent, right? And then, uh, so it was really good. And one day, uh, we are supposed to do bird watching. And then uh, other uh, members of the bird watching society did not show up. My wife, at the time, of course, you know, we did not even get together yet, showed up. And then we have a great time. So I was 20-something years old. Um, yeah, and then after taking this picture, I feel like, wow, it's something, you know, that chemistry is like boiling, yeah, and then I start to chase after her, yeah, and uh, yeah, so, so, so that was the little story. And then uh, when I was in Taiwan, uh, uh, there's another thing that I did when I was breeding my birds during my high school time. I started bird watching. I started bird watching without knowing there was an activity called bird watching. Uh, because I started breeding birds, I realized, and then I started interested about the birds in my uh, households, in my neighborhood. And then, uh, and uh, at the times, I was uh, working in a, a silk printing factory owned by my uncle. So this kind of silk printing. And then I managed to spend one month of my salary and bought a binoculars. And that binoculars literally changed my life because through the binoculars, oh my God, birds in around, my, around my house is so pretty. At that time, I observed a pair of Brahmini kite making nests and hatch. And it is just like what you see in Discovery Channel through, bi, through my binoculars. And then in my neighborhood, there's also many um, Orioles, the yellow color bird, yeah, Kowel. And then, uh, and, and, and raptors, amazing, amazing. And then at the times, no one teach me how to, uh, how to bird watching. And then, uh, but I want to know what species of the birds they are. So I went to our Bukit Matarjam uh, public library, pulled up that, at the time, the only uh, few guides available called Birds of Southeast Asia, Ben King. I'm not sure this the shelf over here have or not. And that was a classic uh, and the very first few guides for birds available and many of the plates is black and white. Yeah. So so managed to hey, you know, learn the birds through that. And then when I was in Taiwan, one day I was wandering around the campus and then saw a society, a, a student society is recruiting member and that and that um, uh, uh, student society is called bird watching society. I wonder what bird watching society do. Bird watching, what is that? And I went in, and oh, they start to talking about identify different bird species. I sit down, I learn a lot, and I like it. 
and then and then I joined them as a member and then every weekend we went out to do bird watching. It was wonderful. And because my university uh, in southern Taiwan, close to Kanting National Park, which is at the southern tip of Taiwan, where there's a lots of migratory birds in the winter time, and then there's lots of other you know, residence birds as well. And all of us have a great, great time as a university student, all have the same hobby and interest, but watching. It was great. And then through bird watching, I managed to see the beauty of birds, the beauty of nature, as well as the other extreme, which is the ugly side of uh, misnetting of birds. At the times uh, in southern Taiwan, um, during the migration of brown shrike, a type of birds, brown shrike, uh, Hong Wei Po Lao, and uh, the local farmers would build a trap and that trap is so deadly and so perfect to capture those strike. They stick it, that trap made out of bamboo with a little uh, trigger when the bird step on it, it got caught and then they barbecued it. So the barbecue brown strike is very common along the roadside lean, uh, to the Kanting National Park. So, so that was ugly. Yeah? And then uh, misnetting of birds. Sometimes we went uh, we we went to uh, uh, paddy fields to do bird watching and come across those misnet uh, where the farmer put out and then there was like dead carcass of you know owls, heron, uh, egret and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it was um, yeah it was quite an experience for me to you know see the beauty of nature as well as the destructions of humans uh, uh, to, to nature. So bird watching is definitely the thing. And then after I finished my study, because my bird watching skill was great, and then uh, I recruited, I joined the lab of Professor Curtis Pei, who was the advisor for our bird watching society. And at the time he was looking for research assistance on his various wildlife uh, research project that he involved. And this picture was the very first day that I start working in the forest. And then uh, this was in a uh, uh, Taitung uh, mountain range. And uh, this is my senior and his hand is a hundred path viper. Uh, in Taiwan, there are five venomous snakes, and this is number one, the most venomous snakes uh, in Taiwan. And the Chinese name is Pai Pu She, means that 100 path viper, means that after you got bitten, you only have, can walk for 100 steps. After that, you drop dead. <laughs> it is, that di it is that deadly, and that day, I almost stepped on it. You know, it is. Uh, it got a great camouflage uh, with the dead, dead leaf on the ground. They are on the ground, so you know, easily step on it. Uh, yeah, so that was my very first few days working in the forest. And then uh, later on, I was in charge of several uh, uh, research projects of fauna survey. It means that I need to go to that area. And my typical day would be like wake up five in the morning when it is still dark and then cook my breakfast, entering the trailhead and start my bird survey when the sun start to come out, when it is still dawn. And then uh, so I survey for birds present. Uh, because of my bird watching skill is really good, a lot of the uh, people, when, we, when the skill is good, means that you don't have to see the birds. You just listen and start writing, start writing, start writing. Yeah. So that's what I do. And then, uh, yeah. and then also, uh, the fauna survey also involving using camera trap. This was me. And this was the camera trap that I used back in 1992. Yeah, the camera trap at the time consists of the box is an ammo cartridge box, metal with two uh, dry battery and a 36 exposure point and shoot Olympus weatherproof camera. And the sensor is a microwave sensor. 
the whole unit weighs about 10 kilograms. And then it only can take 36 pictures at a time. And so every single picture that we managed to take in is like precious. Really, really a lot of hard work. And the terrain to enter a lot of the Taiwan mountain is 60 degree or more. The slope is 60 degree or more. So a uh, lot of hiking. You can all, my hand will carry 10 kilo, 10 kilo. It's like, you know, carrying 10 kilogram dumbbell and then plus another two more 10 kilogram dumbbell in the backpack. So we can only carry four. High up and then uh, set up those camera. And then of course we take great pictures of like uh, lots of wildlife, yeah, um, yeah. and then uh, so that was daytime and then another thing that I do during the daytime is set up uh, 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 Sherman uh, rodents trap for trapping small mammal, yeah, and then at night time, this is my outfit in, in night time, headlamp, dress up because some of the area are very cold and then I have my machetes with me and then my camera and uh, to look for snakes and uh, snakes and frogs, yeah. So it was uh, pretty cool. And then uh, so this was one of the uh, bird watching trips. And uh, also at the times, uh, Professor Chris uh, uh, Curtis Pay also have another project working with Manjang. This is the Formosan Reef Manjang, you know, Kijang. In Borneo, we have two species of uh, two species of Manjang. The yellow, Bonin yellow munjek, which is a Bonin endemic, Muntiacus arthroides, and the red Indian red munjek, the Muntiacus muntiacus. In Taiwan, they have an, an, uh, they have an endemic as well called Muntiacus rivesi, the Formosan reef munjek, which is a lot smaller, and that study involving radio telemetry of munjek in Taiwan. And I was the um, research assistant. And then we work with Aborigines people, the Aborigines uh, guide or research assistant, actually they're hunters. And then I turn research assistant. We pay them a lot of money to ask them to help live trap this manjak to, to us. So you can see how small it, it is, yeah. And then, uh, and then that would be the very first radio telemetry of manjaks in, 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 in Taiwan. So we do uh, triangulation with topographic map, you know, uh, using, using compass. Yet is this work was exactly the same I did when I studied sun bears back in 1998 until 2000. So 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 I so this is the place where I learned. And at the time, I'm not even started my undergraduate degree yet. Yeah. So it was great. Uh, and then after that, my girlfriend, who's my wife right now, uh, also come with me, and it was great. You know. Yeah. When we were like in the field and blah blah blah. And then uh, it re requires a lot of hiking. The elevation over there is uh, 2,000 meters, yeah, 2,000 or more. And there is a high elevation uh, lake called Xiao Kui Hu, Little Ghost Lake. And it's a sacred place for the local Lu Kai tribe. And then, uh, and then this is uh, our little camp, little hut, where we store the equipment. And this is a recorder to record the Manjak activities. And during that time, I learned something. Uh, this project was collaborated with uh, Professor Dale McCullough from UC Berkeley. Uh, at the time, he was doing his uh, sabbatical in Taiwan and Professor Dr. Curtis Pei. And Dr. Uh, uh, Dale McCullough told me, if something breaks down in the mountain, don't come down. Fix it until it is fixed and working, then you come down. And I realized that, oh yeah, we have to do that. Because at the times, anything that broken, your motorbike broken, you have to fix it on the ground. Your equipment broke down, you have to fix it on the ground. You are the mechanic. If you don't do it, you cannot come down because you will waste a lot of time and efforts. And, uh, and so, every, so, so everything is that we, ne we need to fix it ourselves. Uh, yeah, so it was a, it was a great experience uh, to work with uh, him and then, and then uh, that study area also have a peak, uh, more than two thousand in, in in elevation, and this peak was very cool because from this peak I can see. From the west is, the west coast of Taiwan to the sea. From the east I can see the east coast of Taiwan. So it's like a ridge at the southern southern Taiwan, 
and it's very, very cold. And at night times, we got uh, many, many nights where we have frost. Uh, means that the temperature dropped below uh, zero degrees. Yeah. So using radio telemetry to figure it out uh, locations of uh, Manjang. So it was pretty good experience uh, in Taiwan, and it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then, uh, so this particular paper, Home Range Activity Patterns and Habitat Relations of Reefs Monjak in Taiwan. That's the paper where my name showed up for the very first time in a scientific paper. Yeah, Wong Siu Ti, in the acknowledgement, all right? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so that's a very good experience. And then when I come down from the mountain or come down uh, finishing few work, I work in a lab. And at the time, Professor Curtis Pace set up a wildlife rescue center. Yeah, a wildlife rescue center for protected species. Uh, this is a baby mass palm civet. The mass palm civet in Taiwan is completely different from our mass palm civet. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the rescue center also rescue all kinds of animals, owls, uh, orangutan. And at that rescue center was set up mainly because of orangutan. And why is orangutan in Taiwan? This was in back in 19, early, uh, early 90s. Why is orangutan in Taiwan? Uh, it's because at that time, Taiwan uh, have this economy boom. Many people become so rich in a relatively short period of time. But their education did not improve. The law did not improve. Okay, so anybody, and at the times, there was one phrase that very popular amongst the, uh, the local Taiwanese is, 只要我喜欢,有什么不可以? As long as I like, why not? So it means that as long as they want to do something, they can. With the money that they, uh, that they have, they are capable of spending that kind of money. At the times, you can buy a baby orangutan in a local pet shop for 10,000 uh, NT, which is uh, 10, uh, 10, oh no, uh, for 10,000 ringgit. Yeah, at the times, the Taiwan to Malaysian ringgit is 1 to 10. 10,000 for a baby orangutan. 7 to 8,000 for baby gibbons. You know, that kind of situation. And all of these animals come from where? Come from here. Yeah. At the times, logging at its peak. And at the time, there was one TV program called One Pi Jia Zhu, uh, where the hoes have a baby orangutan dressed up in humans or in uh, infant outfit. And then after that program's air, everybody say, I want one, so cute. And it literally fuel the interest of general public having exotic pets. And at the time, there was no law in Taiwan to prohibit people from keeping orangutans given sun there as well at the time. And then uh, when the baby orangutan, yes, it is very cute, uh, but they grow up. And when they grow up, people cannot handle anymore. Uh, and, and people have uh, estimate at a time, every one baby orangutan end up in Taiwan. Behind it, there was 19 orangutan, uh, there was 19 death orangutan. First, in order to capture a baby orangutan, the mother has to be killed by the people from Borneo or Sabah, literally. And then, uh, and then 10, one out of 10 baby orangutan that got shipped out, not through aeroplane, but by a fishing boat. That from Borneo, Sabah, and then meet up with the fishing boats from Taiwan going southward, and they trade in South China Sea. Yeah. And only one out of 10 can make it alive, landed, on the islands of Taiwan. Because of all of these baby infant orangutans needs a lot of maternal care, needs special care, okay? And of course, the best care of a baby orangutan is orangutan mother. But orangutan mother has been killed, brutally killed. 
and then uh, so many of them did not make it and even the one that make it finally make it okay being so as pets this is Pauli this is Polly uh, our very first baby orangutan and the first day when she arrived we put it uh, we put her on a cage with rope okay and it is very I mean common sense that orangutan will swing isn't it but the next day when I go and see uh, went to see uh, Polly she showed me her face and her, 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 her palms was like broken skin, uh, broken skin, bleeding. Why? Because she never hold a rope before. She was brought up in a household like that, toilet train, die on a table together with her master. And then to a point where she grow bigger and bigger and start to poke on the switch, hold on. You know, anything, that thing. Nobody can handle a baby orangutan or growing up orangutan or an adolescent orangutan at your home. They are so curious, one thing, and second, they are so capable of doing things, mimic things, and sometimes destroying stuff. And you can, if, imagine that orangutan start playing with your stove, start playing with your tap water, start playing with electric city. You know, it is, it is a... a, a yeah, it's a public uh, concern. And I, at the times, there was one time I was assigned to capture and abandon orangutans in a, uh, in a, in a, in a small town, in a mountain, uh, where the owner uh, drive that orangutan and abandon the baby orangutan in the hope that she will live in the forest in Taiwan. But of course, it is not because all of these baby orangutans are associate human with food, grow up in a human environment. Uh, they will look for, when they are hungry, they will look for people. So at the end, that particular orangutan was captured by the local police and the police station have no cage, right? So they chucked that orangutan in a room. I was there to, you know, together with our, 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 our teacher, our professor from, from, the, uh, from the vet clinic, uh, from the vet hospital, to sedate that orangutan in a, in a, in a police station. Yeah. Luckily, for some reason, they did not put the orangutan in a lockup. They should. <laughs> yeah, in a, in a police station. But anyway, that's one of the story. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, this is Sarah, um, a volunteer from UK, come to help us uh, take care of the baby orangutans. And then, beside orangutans, you, not sure you can, you can see this. This is two little uh, gibbons, yeah, agile gibbon, black-handed gibbons. And then these gibbons was among the Caesar that the police made busted a drug dealers. He has four baby orangutans and uh, two baby gibbon. And that gibbon, when... The police got them is, is, uh, is, is like this big. It's, it's like this big. Yeah, I, I have another greater picture, but I cannot uh, uh, show it. I uh, cannot find, find, find that picture. It's tiny. I need to bring both of them back to my room and nurse them 24 hours because every one and a half hour, they were mm, 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 hungry. I need to wake up and feed. Yeah, so during that time, I already become the Papa Gibbon, you know, beside Papa Bear, right? Yeah, so, so, so of course, Gibbons growing up, uh, yeah, that's, 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 there are two of them. One of them is called Da Luo Bo the other one is called Xiao Luo Bo Tou, means big uh, daikong radish and small daikong radish. Yeah, yeah. So that's Da Luo Bo this is yeah, the big one. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so where are they come from? In Taiwan, you will be amazed, the amount, the the species of gibbon showed up on Taiwan Islands. It's literally coming from across Southeast Asia, from the very common, the la gibbon, the white-handed gibbon. This is agile gibbon, the black-handed. They are uh, hulok gibbons. They are Konkoro gibbons, come from Vietnam, come from Hainan Islands, come from Cambodia. Uh, and there's also Siamang as well, come from Peninsula and, 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 and Sumatra. So during that time, the network of wildlife trafficking is really, really uh, open, we are really amazed, you know, because there's a lot of profits into it. And this was more than 30 years ago. 
Uh, and then uh, in the lab, I also got to learn how to stuff animals. This is the little um, Chinese weasel that I stuff. Uh, this is the little flying squirrels that I stuff over there. Uh, pangolin, uh, this was actually, I stuffed this pangolin is in Malaysia. Uh, I pick up this carcass when I was driving my, my motorcycle on the newly opened north-south highway. And then I managed to stuff this. So this is a skill that I learned to stuff animals when I was in Taiwan. And then, uh, and, and this was uh, the, this was the uh, white-fronted uh, langur in Danum. This is the one, without hand, without one hand. And, and this um, leaf monkey was, was stuffed in the freezer for like seven or eight years until I found out, whoa, still in good shape, and then I stuffed her. And these particular specimens have lost one uh, right arm because a raptor killed it and ate the arms, and then the, lap, the raptor dropped the carcass when one of the Danum staff was driving on a logging road. Yeah, so that one particular one, and also a Malay civet. This is the civet that I stuff. I think I did a good job on stuffing animals, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, and then I was working as a research assistant, uh, animal keeper in a rescue center in Taiwan for two years. And then after two years, I feel like, oh, you know, I had enough and I feel like my heart is about wildlife. Because during that two years of experience, I managed to do wildlife research, wildlife survey, and also set up, I mean, help take care of all this wildlife and my heart is with wildlife. And then I want to come back. So, in, in, and, and start and continue my, 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 my study. And then at the times, uh, I applied to um, America University, uh, Professor Dil McCullough gave me a list of university undergraduate degrees, including University of Montana, University of Idaho, uh, Humboldt State University, Colorado State University, all this uh, university with good, uh, good uh, uh, wildlife program with the undergraduate. And Amy Agama is my Fellow students, I study in University of Montana, wildlife biology program. Okay, so I got to know Amy since then, back in 1994, 95, yeah. Anyway, so after I, I am done with Taiwan, I come back. Uh, while I was waiting for my uh, results to wait for the intake of the university in, 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 in the States, I come back to West Malaysia and work with Malaysian Nature Society as a trainee scientific officer. And then, uh, so that was the time where I start really learning about my own country's wildlife and also the forest. And at the times, I know the word deep terror cut for the very first time when I was 25 years old. And deep terror cup is all of these big trees that you see over here. It is the major tree families in our forest. And I was 25 years old and know this term deep terror cup parsi or deep terror cup forest for the very first time. I feel like it is wrong. Something is missing in our education systems. So, and then at the times I was assigned to in charge of the Bulum expedition. If you know what Bulum expedition is, back in 1990. Uh, 19, 1993, 94, uh, Malaysian Nature Society launched the second expeditions in West Malaysia after Undau Rompin. The objective is to document uh, the northern part of Perak, close to the Thai, Thailand border, yeah, south of this uh, uh, this um, uh, the the highway, the the east west highway through Greek over there, and then south, north of this is this black area. Yeah? No one is allowed to go in because there's a lot of communist activities. It was heavily guarded in the northern part of the, of, of the road. And then southern part of the road in this particular river called Sungai Halong uh, is where the base camp of Malaysian Nature Society. And the expeditions is an inventory expeditions to find out, to document what flora and fauna species in that area. Yeah. 
and then uh, so so I was the uh, trainee scientific officer in charge. Two weeks of my time was based here in the forest. Two weeks of my time is based here is is based in Kuala Lumpur to coordinate the researchers, uh, university students of and of going to Belum to do the expeditions, whether find out what species of plants, animals, uh, so on and so forth. So it was great. And then at times I got to learn, uh, I got to know Dr. Lim Buliat. Yeah, Dr. Lim Buliat is by far the greatest biologist, zoologist in Malaysia. And then he passed away uh, just uh, three years ago. And then uh, and, 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 and he was really, really a uh, great person. Lots of knowledge, published lots of uh, papers uh, from bats to small rodents to snakes. Uh, about the Malaysian wildlife, you know, and then, so this picture was uh, taken a few years ago. If you, anybody know this gentleman is? He is Mohamed Khan. Oh, yeah. He is Mohamed Khan, the Mohamed Khan. He was the general director of, uh, of uh, Perhilitan, the Department of National Park and Wild, uh, the Department of Wildlife and National Park, West Malaysia. Yeah, and both of them were the recipient for Merdeka Award. Yeah, very prestigious award uh, in uh, in uh, in Malaysia, you know, contributing towards uh, the Malaysian country and the society. Yeah, uh, so it was great. Dr. Lim Buliat was very active, even at a very senior age. He's still very active. Um, yeah, I mean, great men to, uh, to 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 meet up. And then at the times, uh, because of my of my knowledge on stuffing animals. And I got to know uh, one of the ex-vet from Zoo Malacca. And then uh, he wanted to uh, ask me to teach him how to do taxidermy work, stuffing you know, animals in Malacca Zoo. So I went to Malacca Zoo. And at the time I met, this is Mina, yeah, the Sumatran rhino that was born in Zoo Malacca. Uh, she was not part of, her mother was part of the Sumatran captive breeding program in Malaysia back in the 80s and then but she was conceived in the wild and born in captivity yeah so it was really amazing to see our hairy rhino for the very first time and then that was the time where I realized that hey our Sumatran rhino sing you know and they are very playful she was holding a piece of stick and started to play uh, it was really, really amazing to have such a close encounter. Instead of tiny little insects that I used to deal with when I was in my childhood, so when I grow slightly older, it's this kind of a magnificent, critically endangered species that I need to you know, uh, uh, see or witness or learn their stories. And then, of course, our rhino captive breeding did not end up uh, well. All, you know, the, the one in Sungkai, uh, all of them die in a relatively short period of times, and then uh, yeah, it's fun to work in a it's, it's fun to be in a zoo. You know, you meant to pet a big cat, yeah. And then, and then when I was in a, this is the part that uh, Ian warned me not to show, but I would still show. And then uh, and during that time, uh, this is the at the times newly opened up North South E Highway. And then uh, at the times, right now when you drive on that road, you see a lot of commercial billboards, big signboards, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at the time when it started to open up, the billboard was actually not that many. And there was a field that was stick out, including this one. What does it say? It says we, we green the earth. You remember? Yes, okay, so, you, so, so this is a signboard that erected on the highway. Okay, so, so say we green the earth, you are now passing by an Acacia Megum plantation. There's a series of them. Acacia Megum plantations is one, drive for another 10, 20 kilometers, another one. We green the earth, you are now passing by an oil palm plantation. Yes, yeah, so you, you have seen that. Yeah, okay, so not me, is here. Yeah. And then I'll drive another 10 or 15 kilometers, we green the earth, you are passing through a rubber plantation. <laughs> And you drive for another 10, 15 minutes, or 10 or 15 kilometers or 20 kilometers, and now the sidewalk, we green the earth, you're passing through a golf course. 
And then, look who set this up. Jabatan Perutanan. Yeah. So, I don't want to say anything. I just show you that this is happening. And of course, at the times, I start working in the, our rainforest, which is the most diverse ecosystem on Earth. It's a biodiversity hotspot. Yeah? Uh, with a lots of species that we know and also a lots of species that we don't know. And yet, what happened to our forests by educating the public, we green the earth. So this one will to be cut, yeah? <laughs> anyway, so it's controversial, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to take a picture? Actually, you can see this picture on my Facebook. All right, you've turned down to, very, to my album, to the very, very first few pictures that I posted up. Okay, and then, uh, so that was 1994. In 1995, the summer of 1995, I managed to work with this gentleman. Who is, who is this? Charles Francis. I'm sure many of you have read this book, The Field Guide to Memoir of Borneo. And the author of this book is Charles Francis. And uh, it was back in 1995. I was uh, under second year undergraduate degree students. And then uh, and, and one day I saw an advertisement on the, on the ontological uh, society newsletter and rec recruiting a few assistants, and I applied. And at the time, I was in Montana, and he managed to fly me back to Malaysia to help him. And then, uh, but this picture was taken just last year. Uh, no, last year or early this year? Early this year, yeah. With uh, Cecilia, uh, Charles' wife, originated from Sanakan, Chinese, and then Fiona, their daughter. And back in 1995, we were working in, uh, in uh, Paso Forest Reserve. Paso Forest Reserve, uh, Nangri Sembilan. And then daytime, mist netting birds. Nighttime, hub netting bats. If you know what I mean. Hub, catching bats using hub traps. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, that, that year, that summer, was the most intense field work that I ever did in my whole life, even until, until today. Daytimes from 6 o'clock until uh, sunset at, at 6 o'clock, mist netting, every hour go and check, take out the birds from the mist net, boot pen, release, and then uh, so it going round and round and round all day. And then after that, have one hour of break, rest, dinner. After dinner, about seven something, eight something, open up the trap to capture bats until midnight. Uh, yeah, so it was that kind of life. And I was like really skinny and I learned so much at a time. The same project, one year prior, he has 10 research assistants. That year, he has four. Himself, his wife, Myself and another uh, research assistant uh, called Robert Tizard from, from US. And Fiona at the time was like maybe like four, three or four years old. And they brought Fiona into the forest. It was really amazed me because Fiona is our dictionary for bats or birds' names. She can remember. Fiona, what species of bats is this? Ah. Hypocidrus, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, wow, it was really... And then when we have... Sometimes when we trap animals, there will be animal die, right? That's her toy. <laughs> Playing with, you know, that animal since little. It was, it was so good. And right now, she is a marine biologist, have a PhD degree, yeah, working in, uh, in, in, in Canada. So great reunion after all these years. Yeah, she went, uh, they all come and see me uh, just uh, early this year, I think. Yeah, this picture was taken early this year. So good, good experience working with uh, Charles Francis. And then in 1994, after I finished my, uh, my, my work with, uh, with uh, Malaysian Nature Society, I got accepted to University of Montana and I went to University of Mont Montana in 1994. And then uh, the first year I met this gentleman, uh, Professor Christopher Savine. And uh, one day he came to our uh, uh, class 
to talk about the bear research work that he has, like American black bears uh, in America, in Mexico, uh, brown bears in Europe, grizzly bear in Montana. And at the time, he was the co-chair of the IOCN Bear Specialist Group. Yeah. And also the coordinator for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Grizzly Bear Recovery Coordinator. So in America, they have this Endangered Species Act. Under the Endangered Species Act, the species that lives under the Endangered Species Act, like grizzly bears at the time, they need to come up with a recovery plan, literally to increase the population, to boost up the population so that these particular wildlife species can be removed from Endangered Species Act. This particular species can, can become not endangered. So his job is to do that. And at the same time, he is also the IOC and Bear Specialist Group co chair to make sure that the world populations of bears are surviving, are being studied, and so on and so forth. And at the times, no one ever studies sun bears. We do not know anything about, about the sun bear ecology and so on. And at times, in the books that he write, the bear action plan, in the chapters for the sun bear, he stated that the study of sun bear is the highest priority for bear research, even because we do not know about their basic ecology like food habit, home range size, and things like that. So after the, he was uh, giving the lecture to our class, I'm not sure whether you have had his come to, no, yeah, to Les Markham's class. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I approached him, I said, hey, I'm, I'm a professor, I'm from Malaysia. Uh, we got sun bears in our country. Do you have projects working with the sun bear? He said, no. In fact, he was looking for a Malaysian study, uh, students to study sun bear. I said, choose me, choose me. You know, and, def and, and sure enough, he chose me. We click, and sure enough, after that, we start talking uh, for the next few years. At the time I was on my uh, sophomore year, on my third year, I still got you know, another, on my second year, I still got another two or three more years to go. So, so we managed to start talking, develop the research uh, proposal, get funding, and I have to pass my GRE examination, which is the examinations for to get into the graduate school, to get into the master program. It was a very difficult uh, examination. I managed to get through that and then become the graduate students for, uh, to, to study sun bears at a time. And then, uh, and then before that happened, I need to prep myself to study bears. I did in Taiwan working with the Munjak, Handel Munjak. Yes, I know that 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 processes, but I never worked with bear. So during that time, I was prepped to uh, study bears, and I was uh, uh, become a volunteer in his uh, grizzly bear and black bear projects. So this picture was my first grizzly bear capture. At the times, grizzly bears in lower 48 states is very few, and, uh, and the purpose of this study is to monitor their population by trapping the grizzly bears, put a radio collar, uh, and, uh, and, yeah, and, and, and monitor their movements, and study their ecology, their, their, their biology, and so on. And then uh, that day, I almost pee my pen. Yeah, grizzly bears is not like American black bear. This is a brown color American black bear. Although they look very similar, their behavior is completely different. American black bear evolved in woods, in the forest. If there's any danger, they would ask the cubs to tree, to go up to a tree, or they themselves go up to a tree if there's any danger. Grizzly bear evolved in plains, forest places where less tree, if there's any danger, they stand up and defend. You know, they are very, very aggressive, very, very ferocious. Uh, yeah, and then when a grizzly bear, when a black bear got caught on the snares, you know, we use the outreach foothold snare, it's a cable snare to capture uh, of all bears. When a black bear got caught, well, yes, they will struggle and try to, try to get away. And after a while, they give up. But the grizzly bear rarely give up, especially when they see human approach. Yeah. And then, uh, so what we do next is trying to sedate the bears using a jab stick for the black bear 
because we can get, uh, we can get, let me see, uh, that is a jab stick. At the end of that stick is, uh, as the, at the end of the pole, there is the syringe with the tranquilizer and uh, you have to like, jab this bear. But the grizzly bear, you cannot do that because they will charge and charge and charge. Very, very aggressive. And we have to use a chop shell gun with a dart, with a tranquilizer dart. And it was triggered by, uh, by black powder. It can shoot 50 meters. You know? There's no way that you can do this in a gris uh, for a grizzly bear. They would struggle and run to you and try to you know, kill. Yeah. So it's quite, quite a scary thing. So, so all of this um, good experience for me. And then, uh, and then I, I spent a total of four summers uh, working as a few technicians. I started with volunteers after that, a uh, few technicians uh, to, to, to trap uh, uh, black bears and, and grizzly bears. So I handle more than, more than 100 uh, bears uh, in North America. All these big, big bears compared to the small, yeah, this is Montana, yeah. And then we, oft, we also managed to cross the border to the other side of the border to Canada at Crestons to do the grizzly bear trapping area because the borderline uh, grizzly bear, they travel across the border and they don't you know, see the border as border. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. And then uh, there was also one year where I assist uh, Karen McCoy on her master project, radio coloring uh, black bears to identify where black bear crosses highway because there is a highway developments and then that project is to identify the locations where there is a lot of bears or animal crossing so that they can put a bypass or underpass or lower pass so that it's a wildlife crossing structures to, to minimize roadkill in that stretch of highway. Yeah, so it was pretty good experience to, to, to do this. Yeah. And then of course, back in 1998, I come to Borneo for the very first time to study my belated, my beloved uh, sun bear. Yeah, my beloved. And then at the time, how am I doing on time? Are you still, all, still asleep? No, yeah? Interesting so far? Yeah. So this was a classic picture. At the times when I first came to Borneo to study sun bears, there was two other researchers studying sun bear at the same time as well. Fuyuki Namura um, studying sun bears in Tabin Wildlife Reserve. Gabriela Fredrickson studied sun bears in Kalimantan in Sungai Wan Forest, uh, Protected Forest. And I mean, yeah. this picture was taken more than, what, 25 years ago. Am I still look the same? Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost, okay, okay, yeah. So, so, so that, that was great. The, the, our setting is, the, although three of us studying sun at the same time in Borneo, but our setting is different. My study area is Dunham Valley adjacent to the Ulusagama selectively locked forest, vast forest. Gabriela at Sungai Wan Forest Reserve, 100 square kilometers only, and half of it was burned back in 1997-98 uh, El Nino time. And Fuyuki, Fuyuki Namura is locked over forest in Tabin, uh, uh, station at the uh, wildlife department HQ in Tabin, surrounded by oil palm plantation. So it's a three different setting of uh, of, of sun bears, uh, which is which is good. And for me, because at the times no one ever studied sun bear, we all three of us, you know, try different ways to come out to trap sun bears. And these are the traps that I um, uh, built at the times. There was a wooden box trap that I built in the primary forest in the, time, in the uh, Dunham Valley Conservation Area. Uh, it was pretty cool. The design is, uh, is follow the design where North American trapper trap Wolverine. A door, the lid over here, okay? The bears, well, I have to imagine, right? The bears climb up, sniffing something good inside go in and then this is the stepping board and I place all kind of food. It's like a buffet dinner, all you can eat. I got oil palm seed. I heard some bear love oil palm seed. Then I managed to get one tandan of oil palm, chuck it in there. I also learned that some bear love honey. So I got a bottle of honey, you know, placed in here. 
And this is how a size of a champada at the time was fruiting season, champada, papaya, uh, a wide selection, you know, all you can eat. Yeah, and then some may come and eat, they will step on this, and when they step on this piece of stepping board, it released the trigger that hold the lid. Yeah, there's a cable over here, if you see there's a pulley. Yeah, and then the drawer would drop, and this is the locking mechanism that lock, that latch on the uh, the edge of this particular wood so that the bears cannot you know open up yeah that's the idea that's the idea and then uh, and then of course i did not capture any bears in these kind of traps but managed to capture a lot of bycats it's very very annoying i spent so much effort to this, you know, just the wood itself, I have to spend more than 1,000 ringgit to, to, to buy this wood and then carry each of them. This is hard wood, you know, this is selangan batu, okay? Carry them, assembly, and then manage to capture a bycat Malaysia vet. And when a Malaysia vet went into the trap, and, and well, at least it showed it works, right? It can capture an animal, so which I was very happy. But again and again, Malaysia vet, Malaysia vet, Malaysia vet, become fucking Malaysia vet. <laughs> yeah, it was really annoying because once a Malaysia vet got caught, if a bear come in, the bear have no doors to enter. Yeah, so all of the effort has been wasted. Yeah, so anyway, so Malaysia vet. And then, uh, uh, and then I, at the times, I also managed to build this aluminum covert trap in Montana. The beauty of this aluminum covert trap is that it can be taken apart into nine pieces. The lid itself is one piece, the frame of the door is one piece, the cylinder, one piece, one piece, one piece, one piece, one piece all nine pieces. So I can easily carry it, it's aluminum alloy, relatively light uh, metal, and then bring it into the forest and assemble this trap in the forest and then do the trapping works. It looks pretty cool. and. And sure enough, these traps capture several sun bears, and I'm still using this trap after 25 years. At the time, I spent $4,000 USD, $3,000 on building this, and $1,000 to ship this trap from Montana to here. So $4,000, and until now, I'm still using it. So pretty, pretty worth that kind of a price. And then I also managed to uh, uh, Asked the local workshop to build me this 55 gallon uh, drum to trap bears. This was my very first generation of traps. Uh, yeah, and it is from Esso, you know, green color, uh, blue color. Yeah, and I was still very naive and young at the times. Uh, yeah, let's see whether it, can, will, will it catch bear or not. Yeah, pretty cool. And then in Lok O Forest, in the Ulu Sagama Forest Reserve, I, man, I can, I was allowed to chainsaw down a few laran tree if you know what laran tree or magas you know relatively soft wood not not hard, hard wood yeah and then build this kind of cabin the same design as north american trapper trapping wolverine yeah if you know what wolverine is it's the biggest mustard it's the biggest weasel in the world it is not the x-men wolverine wolverine everybody know x-men wolverine you know hugh jackman yeah but this is not this is the the, 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 the big uh, weasel uh, uh, family called Wolverine. And then it looks natural. I like this trap so much. Did I capture a bear? Yeah, so. And my wooden box trap, I caught a bear. And what happened was that I know it was a bear because the bear leave claw marks on here. I also have a camera trap set outside this trap and I saw a bear when the, bears, when, the, when the door of the trap was still open, and then the next picture was the door closed, and then the next picture, a bear was outside. <laughs> <laughs> the bears managed to get through, chew through. And I did not know that a sun bear is so strong, you know? And then, uh, so, 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 so this just now was the lead, right? And then this time, whoa! The side got a big hole. Yeah. And after this particular incident, I put a layer of zinc in the hope that I can seal it, you know, so that the bear cannot bite. And this is what inside, inside. The bear did it. 
With what? With their teeth. Yeah, so they are so strong. So I totally underestimate how strong is a sun there. My metal box, my metal trap. A big hole. Yeah, it was like, whoa, you know. Holy moly, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that, that is not the end. No, no, there are even more coming out. You remember my, S, my SO uh, drum? You know, it become like that. What happened? Not one, not two. What happened? But anyway, so after four months of trapping bears, and at the times, many people ask me, won't give up, it's not going to work. You know, study some insect in my, in Tiong Wan's backyard or something like that. <laughs> Tiong Wan is the house where I stay, you know. So, but anyway, because my stubbornness, I'm a Taurus. I'm very stubborn, and then uh, managed to capture my very first bears. Uh, it was a great experience because I managed to use my veterinary training skill on my own research. You know, I do not require um, a, a vet to be on site to sedate the animals, uh, to handle, to treat if there's any injuries and things like that. And my wife was with us, uh, was with me at the time back in uh, when I do my uh, master projects. Yeah, so it was it was really good. And then I managed to capture uh, at the times managed to capture uh, six bears uh, at the times, and then four. Um, yeah, managed to you know study them, their their movement patterns, their ecology, and so on and so forth. And the most important is when an animal is on a radio collar, I can track them down in the forest in order to, to try to get close. And at the times, I was so naive that I thought, oh, I would see a sun bear in the forest. But in reality, is that after the two hours of handling, after the bear wake up, I never see this bear again. Or even if I see it's like glimpses of bear, few seconds here and there, because the bears are so secretive, the bears are so... Uh, rare, once they sense human presence, they will run away from people. And all the bears, all the sun bears that live until today, all of them were taught well by their mother, which is run away from human, which is the most dangerous animals ever created by the creators ever on planet Earth. Okay, why? Because what kind of people in the forest? The poachers the enemy of all wildlife. So if you don't run away from people, you end up dead. You know, you won't be able to take part in breeding and then, you know, pass your, gener pass your next generations, uh, and create your next generation and so on. So the idea is trying to get close to the bears, trying to figure out what the bears do. If I'm lucky, I would see the bears, but that rarely happened, okay? And then, uh, so we try to get, I try to get close to the bears to figure out what they do, the feeding side, you know, like a few of these three over here, and I use the radio telemetry, the same method that I used back in Taiwan to study Munjak, yeah, during triangulation. And then uh, when I get close to the bears, oh, my heart was like bounding. I dress up camouflage, and I have this little um, uh, face mask to cover myself in the hope that the bears don't see me. Yeah, so things like that uh, is what I did in the forest. And sometimes I have one experience where I was tracking down a bear uh, and the bears come, another bear, non-collar bear, come down from a fruiting fig tree, just walk past of me. Whew, it was quite something, yeah. And then, uh, so, so, and then in Danum, there was another very interesting place which is called Bukit Ator. Uh, how many of you have been to Bukit Ator? Yeah, Sylvia has. Yeah. So this is the Infapro fire observation tower. It's right in the middle of my study area. And then on this particular point, I can pick up the sun bear signal in 10 kilometers radius. It's a great spot. Every time I went up, I can pick up the, the, the signal, then I can pinpoint which directions was the bear at that particular morning or that, at that particular time. And then uh, this was also the site where I came once a week on that tower to monitor activity, the sun bear activity. I stayed up all night. Uh, sometimes I have my friends or my assistants, we take turns, uh, to monitor the activity patterns of bears uh, on a 10 minutes interval. Yeah? And we can listen if the bears is active. The signal that we receive is loud, is, is, uh, is 
the 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 the, the beeping is loud the amplitude you know loud weak loud weak and also fast quick fast quick fast quick yeah. something like that we that we can know so it was pretty cool uh, that we managed to like you know this is Mark uh, Mark Philip Hart an American's uh, friends who was studying uh, Ao in Taiwan and we managed to become you know good friends and one day uh, one year he was visiting me and then uh, so it was pretty cool I have my little stove and then we like uh, hot pot you know steamboat you know for dinner and cook all night yeah, and eat all that at the same time monitor it and then um, this is an old classic picture if you know who this this is my wife of course and this who is this anybody know that's Ian Koo the president of Sabah Society uh, Sanakan branch right now yeah Ian Koo and at the time she was doing she was uh, what second or third year in university and she was doing her internship at Danum managed to tag along with me uh, tracking bears for a few days in the forest as well as uh, monitoring bears at night times uh, yeah so this is a classic picture <laughs> yeah and then uh, on that observation platform you know is I managed to witness the beauty of our rainforest really beautiful early in the morning the misty this is low elevation 300 meters and yet every day afternoon after the afternoon rain in the tropical rainforest the humidity build up the mist build up and then uh, when the temperature drops the the, the little drops that really accumulate become very very thick and uh, it's become a very xianjing uh, xianjing is what mystical you know world beautiful beautiful you have to see this you have to witness it with your own eye in order to appreciate how pretty it is so down in valley Next, oh, oh, I need to, I need to go really fast, yeah, already, yeah, um, and then, uh, and then in the process, in the, in uh, late the year 2000, I visited Gabriela Frederiksen's, uh, her study area to see her uh, study, how was she going on, uh, how was her study, and then uh, when she was doing her wow uh, sun bear study, she also managed to rescue and rehabilitate a few ex-pet sun bear and when the times when I visit her she have the fourth uh, sun bears that she rehabilitated and raised and this bear is called she have no name she called uh, everybody call her Sikachir the little one and then that was my very first sun bear cups experience managed to you know have my finger let her suck no 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 suck hold her and it was great, it was great. And I managed to capture this picture. And if you notice this picture, this picture become the logo of BSBCC. Two months after I took this picture, she was killed by another bear. Yeah, and at the time, Gabriela was absolutely heartbroken. I told her that, you know, we are going to honor the little one when we are going to make this picture a well-known picture. At that time, there was very, very few pictures, or literally none, no pictures of sun bears taken from the wild setting. All of the pictures of sun bears that I managed to tell other people is from uh, zoos. All obese or very skinny and it's ugly looking bears in a very unnatural uh, 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 environment or background. And this one happened to be in the wild. You know, I take it with my Nikon FM. Uh, 100 millimeters telephoto lens, perfect setting. She looked at me like that, and I realized that this is how sun bears sleep in the forest. Sun bear have this inward bent leg, if you notice, and the reason for that is they lock themselves on the branch on the tree and sleep and don't fall. Yeah, so pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and then this is another rhino. And this is Tanjung. Yeah, this is, uh, I took this picture in 19, uh, yeah, 1998 or 1999 or something like that in, in, uh, in Sapilo, actually. Yeah, this is Tanjung. And Tanjung was killed from a fallen branch in 2006. Yeah, so it was very, very uh, tragic to have that kind of thing happen. This is Golugop. 
uh, and the last rhino from the 1980s Sumatran captive breeding programs uh, and he, she died in Lokawizu. Yeah. She was uh, originally from Sepilo and then moved to Tabe, moved to uh, Lokawi and, and, and died there. Anyway, so uh, the, the, the extinctions of Sumatran rhino in Sabah or in Malaysia is actually a very sad uh, story for wildlife conservation because such a magnificent uh, wildlife has come to an end because of human activity and this is something that we all need to, you know, uh, need to uh, think about. And then in the process of working in the forest, of course, forest jump, uh, this forest uh, jumbo, the elephants is something that we cannot miss out, you know. Yeah, so it's a great story to tell. Whoops. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. And then, uh, and then back in 1998, uh, I also managed to set up camera traps. Uh, at the times, the camera trap has slightly improved. Instead of the 10 kilograms uh, batteries that power the sensor, and right now we are using this 9 volt of a... Uh, uh, 9 volt uh, batteries to, 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 to power the sensor and then also with a point and shoot camera, the 36 exposure and this was me in Danum and then uh, yeah and managed to capture many interesting wildlife. This picture was the very first picture of what is this animal? Malay weasel ever capture ever capture very first, yeah, and this picture made the cover of small carnivore conservations back in 2006, yeah, and uh, it was like, wow, we got this, you know, white color and bushy thing. And right now, of course, with camera traps, actually, there are many people have, have got great pictures of, of uh, Malay weasel, uh, yeah. So anyway, so another thing to show off, uh, so small camera trap pictures, this is a colored mongoose, this is a? Banded linsang. This is a yellow throated martin. Yellow throated martin. Actually, there are two yellow throated martin uh, over here. One over here and the other one over here. So they are a diurnal predators, always hunt in pair. And they can take down a prey as big as a munjack. Yeah. Uh, Call it mong uh, the short, short tail mongoose. And then, of course, Malay civet. Lots of lots of Malay civet. If you notice the same side, this side is very productive and I managed to capture this as well. This picture was very interesting because this cloud leopard was one of the very first cloud leopard ever, not only the, one of the very first cloud leopard uh, camera, camera trap, but the same side, same angle, same location, I managed to capture a sun bear. And I managed to trap this particular sun bear and he weighed 40 kilograms, it's a male. And you check out the size, oops, you check out the size of this cloud leopard. It's big. And at the time, I, after seeing this, whoa, I said, there's no way that this cloud leopard is the same species as the cloud leopard that Lon Grassman, at the time there was a, uh, a PhD project in Thailand uh, studying wild cloud leopard in Thailand and Lon Grassman is the American student who study cloud leopard and he live trapped cloud leopard and his male adult cloud leopard weigh 15 kilograms and this particular this bear weigh 40 kilograms how much how heavy do you think this particular individual weigh so it must be at least 30 or 28 or 29 or something like that. And that is the same similar size of the, uh, considered as the uh, 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 big cats, like spotted leopard. And at the times, cloud leopard in Borneo is a subspecies of the Neophilus nebulosa. And uh, because of this, Andrew Kitchener uh, uh, used, this, used this particular picture uh, to, 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 to distinguish, to say that the bony clouded leopard is a, a not, is a distinct species. It shouldn't be considered as a subspecies, but should be elevated to a full species status. 
And then they also published another genetic uh, paper about the cloud leopard in Borneo. Sure enough, it's very different and should be considered as, is, as the species by own. If eventually, it is called the diet cloud leopard. It's a different species. Yeah. And then uh, the patterns of the cloud leopard is different from the mainland of the Sumatra. Yeah. And then other cats as well. This is marble cat. Big marble cat. Marble cat is the size of a big hairy breeds like what uh, like Persian cat. Big bushy tail, beautiful. And what about this one? Bay cat. Yeah, bay cat. Very very rare bay cat. Marble cat. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Anyway, sun bear, sun bear, color sun bear, non color sun bears. Yeah. Obviously, I know. You know. I still got several bears that I haven't captured yet. Elephant, uh, yeah, I got so many. I, I, my car was damaged by elephant. My trap was better. Of course, my camera trap also managed to uh, damage by elephant as well. This is one of the good ones that I managed to capture. Yeah, and again, yeah. this is in Tarvin. At the time, there was elephant riding in Tarvin. Yeah, Sylvia knows. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, wildlife wong, right? You know, working with wildlife species and blah, blah. And then back in 2004, I did a survey of captive sun bear across Malaysia. And that was another eye opening uh, episode that I come across. You know, all of these are in very, very sad stage. And this particular picture was in Kudat uh, Victoria Zoo. And if you note, if you read the cyborg, it says panda. Yeah, it's a panda pointing to two bears over there. And then we managed to, right now, these two bears are at BSVCC. Panda and Kudat is their name, <laughs> for obvious reason. Yeah, and then, uh, and, and because of this survey, I come across so many uh, captive bears in bad, bad, bad conditions. And that's the reason why I set up the Bodhian Summit Conservation Center, because I know that the situation is really bad. Uh, yeah, and something need to be done, and this madness of keeping sun bears as pets have to be stopped. Okay, I'm going to go really quick. Uh, sorry to talk a little bit longer than usual. I hope you all are still with me. And then, uh, and then in 2005, I come back to Sabah for the third time to initiate my Borneo Sun Bear and BLP Research and Conservation Project. This is my uh, PhD project working with both bears and pigs at the same time. And again, initiate another round of trapping. Okay, so right now I have my trapping traps uh, ready and da 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 and da da da. It was pretty cool to trap large mammals and then, you know, bears. The, the, when I did my master project, I first, I, cop I captured my first bear after four months of trapping. Yeah, people ask me to give up. But when I come back to trap bear for the second time, the very first week of my trapping in my, for my PhD work, I captured three bears in the first week, including one day I have two bears in my traps. I said, yes, I'm the man. <laughs> but after a year, I have no trap, I have no bears after one year. Yeah, bear trapping is that challenging, is that challenging, yeah. Yeah, and then also managed to, trap, uh, managed to capture and put video color. And this was literally the very first Bearded pig got live trap and set and wear a radio collar. Yeah, so it was so a. So you put like a belt around. Yeah, it? like a harness because I pigs. Remember we talked about how to how to. Track. Yeah, so it's pigs like pig. pigs have no necks, right? Oh, exactly. So it has to have a harness. Yeah. Anyway, so that was trial error. That kind of situation. It was the handling of pigs is another one hour of talk if you have time <laughs> yeah anyway so i'm not going to go through that and uh, it's, again the experience is really cool oh where's the slide yeah and then uh, other than that i also capture other non-target like a uh, clouded leopard and at the time andy hearn and joanna ross were studying uh, cloud leopard in danum and they were trying really hard to trap cloud leopard and the very first cloud leopard happened to be in my pig traps, <laughs> baited with chicken wings. You know, the, 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 the chicken wings tip that the kitchen of Dunham discard. I said, give it to me, please. And sure enough, I got 
uh, uh, labyrinth. Yeah, and then beside that also, you know, all a lot of the non-target uh, uh, species. Uh, yeah, porcupine. Yeah, it was uh, pretty cool. Anyway, so in 2007, um, actually 2000, yeah, yeah, before 2007, uh, already start working with uh, 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 Sapilo, and then uh, helping the uh, bear cubs over there. And then in 2008, I founded the Bonin Summit Conservation Center, thanks to Sylvia Yorat, yeah, as the very first person who helped me from day one. So thank you, Sylvia. And we managed, we, we did it after, you know, and right now it's 15 years from 2008. So a lot of hard work of building up the, uh, uh, the, the conservation uh, center. So, so that was me. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, the center aims to conserve sun bear through holistic approach that incorporates improved animal welfare, education, research, and rehabilitation. And it is a partnership between, among wildlife department, forestry department, and lead NGO where Sylvia Urat uh, worked until today. And then, uh, so, uh, and then over the years, we developed our pillars, including, you know, ecotourism, uh, community conservation, uh, anti-poaching, captive breeding, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, so when I look back of my 30, 40, 50 years of history, and, I've, I, and I kind of summarize of the, of, the, of the traits that I have, of the what strength, weakness that I have, and I you know, kind of come up with some, some, some elements that bring me what I become today. One, of course, is interest, you know, follow my heart. Uh, this is Gina, the bark eagle owl chicks that I raised since little in my office in Sapilo. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so interest is very important. And then, you know, loves, come on. You know, how can you say no to this baby orangutan, right? Taking care of sun bear. People call me Papa Bear. You know, I got so attached. But when you take care of infant primates, you're literally treating them like your own cute, or own, own children. It's, you have, you, you're so at attached, you know, to it for no reason and no expect for any reward. You just want to give your love help them as much as possible, you know, just like what I did with my son bear cubs. Knowledge, of course, you know, as a, a biologist, as a, a tropical forest ecologist, the, the amount of knowledge from our, um, that we can learn from our wildlife, from our forest is vast. So many things that we need to learn in order to learn the, understand the entire pictures. It's very important. So if people ask me, especially the younger generation students, Hey, study hard, you know, don't party too hard in, 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 in college, in school. Yeah, you need to learn. And then personal attitude, try to be humble. I try to be humble, seriously. Avoid arrogance, you know, egoistic. It's okay to say sorry. If you did wrong, just say sorry. Face the consequences and make sure you don't repeat it again and move on. This is what is the, you know, the process. And then endurance, be tough. Working in the forest is something that I learned. You have to be tough in many, many occasions. Yeah, this picture was the flood in the year 2000, the La Nina, yeah, the La Nina flood. And then I uh, came in the forest. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, again, another <laughs> the trap with a, bro with, with, a, with a big hose on it, you know. And then teamwork is extremely uh, important as well. The works that we do, it's never about me. I did not do everything. It's my team uh, did everything on the ground. You know? So I always be thankful for all of the teamworks that we did. Uh, this picture was taken in the 2013 uh, fundraising even, event called Big Dreams Little Bear. Our big dreams for dead little sun bears. Yeah? So it was great. And with that evening, we managed to raise some 400,000 ringgit in Sanakan. And of course, we did another first fundraising events in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 2008. Uh, you know, work hard, nothing is easy. Uh, who said it is easy? You know, the work that we do is not easy, but is it possible? And another thing is turn the anger into positive power to change. You know, when we come across snares, this was the snaring incidents in Danum, uh, where a sun bear got snared. And I went in and that day I saw like, you know, I don't know how many dozens of snares. Yeah. And then uh, in the process of like this kind of things, you know, the, our beloved animal, they got pushed, they got eaten, they got, uh, you name it, you know. 
this was a three-legged sun bear that helped Cheryl Chia, uh, uh, the, the Cheryl Chia trap in, in, in Crow Wildlife Reserve, three-legged. Why three-legged? Because it got snares. Elephant carcass that I encountered. This elephant, female elephant, have like 18 bullet holes on his back, on her back. And it was dropped dead beside the road in Dan. And one day when I drive, oh, there was a people shot in. And then it's a slow death that these females encounter. Uh, very, very sad. And obviously, yeah. And then passions do what you do best is something that is very important, ladies and gentlemen. And perseverance. Passion and perseverance is something that Angela Dockwood says about grit. The, one of the traits for a successful person is to have this grit. Grit is the power of passion and perseverance. Passions and never give up. Perseverance, yeah, very, very important. And then, of course, everybody knows Jane Goodall. And back in the early 90s, I read her book called Through the Window. The very first page, she said, only if we understand will we care. Only if we care will we help. Only if we help shall all be safe. Okay, and, and for her at a time when she was working in Gombe studying the chimpanzee, she's at that understand stage. So am I when I come to Sabah, Borneo, Danum to study wild sun bears. Understand. Only if we understand can we care. Care comes from the heart, right? And only if we care will we help. Help is action. Only if we have actions, then they will be they shall be safe. So for uh, Jane Goodall is the chimpanzee in Gombe for me, is Sanders in Sabah. Yeah. And then another, yeah, so I managed to meet her in person a few years ago. It was great. She's just filled with positive energy, even at her senior age. You know, she never gives up, she never rests. Yeah, so it was great. Another great person that I met is Sylvia. You know who is this? George Scheller. She is the greatest field biologist ever, George Scheller. So this is the books that the George Schellers have published and studied. He, he has studied in Serengeti Plains about lion, tigers in India, Mongolia, snow leopard, giant panda in, in Wulong, Tibetan, you know, this and that, and gorilla as well. So, so, so he once said, you can do the best sign in the world, but unless emotion is involved, it is not really very relevant. Conservation is based on emotion. It comes from the hearts and one should never forget that. So a lot of the work that we do is come from the heart. Come, you have to be emotion. And sometimes people criticize me, say, whoa, you are too emotion. I say, if I don't have emotion, I wouldn't do what I do. You know, a lot of the thing is that, you know, come on, the animal is dying. Yeah, if we don't speak for them, then who? You know, so things like that. And then another things that I learned over the years is this something that I call positive feedback loop. I got a big mouth. All right. I never keep quiet. When I do something good work, I want the world to know so that I so that I can receive some support, some help. With some support, with more help, I do more good work and I let the world know. You know, if you look at my Instagram, if you look at my social media. And then, uh, and, and that will attract more resources. If with more resources, I can do more good work. You know, this is called the positive feedback loop. And we are on that, on that stage. And, uh, and, and, and a few years ago, I learned about the law of attraction. And I said, holy moly, this is exactly what I did. Over the last 40 years, since seven years old, I said I want to be an animal expert. You know, the seed of the law of attraction is already planted there. So if you do not know what is law of attractions, Google it tonight. <laughs> Read this book called uh, The Secret, you know, yeah, the law of attraction. Yeah. So it was really, really good, good things. And then a few years ago, I also learned another thing called Ikigai. When I look at it, whoa, Ikigai consists of four circles. The first circle is do what you love. The second is do what you're good at. The third is called do uh, what you can be paid for. And the, third, uh, the fourth is do what the world needs. When you do what you love and you do what you're good at, it is called passion. If you do what, you're good, what you are good at and what you can be paid for, it's called profession. 
if you do what you can be paid for and do what the world needs, it's called vocation. And missions is do what you love and do what the world needs. Is it enough? Try the intersection of these four circles. And when I, when I see this, I told myself, wow, I have reached my ikigai. Yeah, this is the teaching of the Japanese about life, about the mission of life. If somebody can reach that ikigai, you are in good hand. And that's it. You, know, you don't need to search anymore. You just do what you are doing and continue to do it. And the world will be a better world. Yeah. And uh, a few years ago, we managed to, I managed to uh, know Jim, uh, Dame Judy Dench. And in the books called Saving Sun Bear, you know, she said, Wong is an incredibly committed and charismatic man. And I highly recommend this inspirational story about his life and an important work. It's a hundred ringgit, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> a little advertisement at the end. And finally, I want to thank my family for supporting me all these years and then uh, apologize for not being there uh, all these years. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.